gospel, and I've said this to you before, what does that mean for the form of the homily? Long or short, time will tell. It is not good for us to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. Words of the reading today. If you think for a moment, I don't, don't think any of us could come up with the correct number. How many uh, movies, how many fairy tale stories or books have been written about finding true love? Seems to be a wonderful storyline. Hmm? And in real life, what is true love? Well, true love is that love that endures the passage of time and the joys and particularly the, the hardships of life. To endure all of this is really the, the gift of true love as you remain together. And what is the world really in need of today? Love. Don't need to even turn on the 6 o'clock news or 11 o'clock news any longer. We've got problems. We have wars waging in many places of the world. Sharp divisions in many countries, including our own. We have many individuals and families and stress. And uh, the bottom line, we we genuinely need love. And we look to the new school year. How many school shootings have there been already? And even in our own community, there was threats at Clarence High School not that long ago. Violence on our campuses. What do we need? We we need visible signs of love. And we still really suffer the effects from isolation, particularly from COVID, where we were isolated. Many are still isolated. And, and then uh, we have the isolation ongoing issue caused by technology. Where do many people, particularly our younger people, spend most of their social time? In front of a screen to be on a computer or iPad or, or a phone. It's not good for us to be alone. And we are reminded in the first reading that God provides for our need of love and community. Trusting in God's providence, however, is often difficult. Now, I'm sure you know the line, looking for love in all of the wrong places, right? How many of you know that line? It's an old one, you know? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, I suppose that line probably really exists because we don't always trust in God's providence. Sunday's readings today, you know, remind us how God created us out of love. And God created us for love. God provides the necessary relationships we must have in our life, and God provides us with community to sustain that. But that requires one important thing, our cooperation, our recognizing God's will, and putting faith and trust and living out God's law and teaching. In Genesis today, God is very active and, and hard at work creating the world, kind of organic, you know, getting his hands dirty. And God is very intimate with Adam, and he sees Adam's need for a relationship, and God creates all these different animals, but none of them seem to really fulfill the man, and God sees Adam's need for community, and so he creates that suitable partner. God provides. God creates the, the first human community, Adam and Eve. And Adam's longing for a helpmate is fulfilled. I believe we all have that desire for community. We all have that desire for love, relationship, friendship. I think um, we're wired for it as human beings. However, our relationships will fail if they are not rooted in Christ. 
They're not rooted in God. Over 32 years as a priest, I've had the privilege to come to meet many, many people. And the, the ones that I see who have the strongest relationships, the strongest families, the strongest set of personal friends are, are those that are rooted in Christ and in the gospel and faith, that they're able to share every level, including faith, within that family or circle of friends. Well, you know, God instituted in the uh, reading today, marriage. Husband and wife, Adam and Eve, the first married couple. And uh, Adam and Eve received from God, as married couples do today, a very powerful gift from the Lord. And that powerful gift is the invitation to be a co-creator with the Lord to bring life into the world. The sign of marriage is the sign of love. The sign of marriage is the, the sign of God's presence in the world today. All relationships take work, I think we'll agree. Now I'm not married, so it's the married man making, uh, sorry, the unmarried man making uh, the observation of married couples, but I think I'm pretty correct in saying marriage takes work, <laughs> takes work. Friendships take work. Family life takes work. Relationships with God takes work. Marriages that really are vibrant, friendships that are vibrant, families that are vibrant are willing to roll up their sleeves to do that work and to include God in the mix. Relationships ultimately are life-giving. They are a sign of the fruit of that gift of love. Jesus in the gospel reminds us again about the importance of marriage, but uh, at the end of the gospel, the reason we took the long form, he again, you know, reminds us of the importance of children. So often in the gospels, Jesus points to the children and says we have to be just like a child in order to enter the, the kingdom of heaven. We have to be like a child in order to accept the kingdom of God. Well, why? Basically, children are pretty humble. They know they have to rely on their parents for everything. They know that. Sometimes us older kids even know we have to still rely on our parents. Hmm? You know? Children uh, know their limitations. Even if they want um, to push the envelope a little, they know at the end of the day they need help and protection. Our relationships with God, they often fail when we forget humility. Our relationships with one another fail when we forget humility. Our relationships fail when we forget our own limitations and our, our need for one another, community, to have that suitable partner, to be a suitable partner in marriage, if it be a suitable partner in friendship, if it be a suitable partner as we collectively work as the body of Christ in the world today. Our relationships fail when we refuse to admit that there are areas where we each fall short and that we need one another to function as community. Uh, an idea, not an idea, a reality that maybe many are not aware that starting Christmas Eve this year for a year, we have a, a jubilee year. Jubilee year. The Pope has called for the year of Jubilee. Now many of you remember the year 2000, the last Jubilee year. And Jubilee year comes from the scripture, quick crash course. Jubilee ordinarily would be after seven sets of seven years, meaning the 50th year would be a Jubilee. But there are other times that Jubilee years are called for and our Pope has called for a Jubilee year. And in this jubilee, according to scripture, it's a time to set things straight. In the scripture, if, if you had slaves, they were set free. Land was returned to its rightful owner. All debts were forgiven. And the one that I liked the most, no one had to work. I really liked that idea. You know, and... Uh, even the land wasn't farmed to give it a chance to rest, to be rejuvenated. Jubilee year, the Pope is calling us to that for one year, and he's calling us pilgrims of hope. That's the theme. And isn't that what the world needs? Hope. 
You and I as baptized members of the body of Christ, as Catholics, we're called to be that light of Christ, that pilgrim of hope, and the Pope is calling us to do so. And he is specially saying, as you prepare to start the Jubilee, pray the Psalms. He has specifically focused us towards the Psalms. And of course, in the Psalms, we have one sung at Mass and offered at Mass every day. But uh, maybe look just at today's Psalm and the beautiful refrain. May the Lord bless us all the days of our life. Pray that psalm. Pray that psalm like a child, asking God the Father to bless us and to provide for us. Pray that psalm as a prayer of humility. Pray that psalm as an acknowledgement of your own limitation and your own reliance on God. Pray that psalm to truly have the Lord put genuine life and love into your life. Pray it, remembering that you are the community, the body of Christ. God did not create us to be alone. These readings are perfect as we come to this Sunday, first Sunday of October's Pro-Life Sunday. And we have life chain, as you know, in front of our church, two o'clock to three o'clock today. I invite you to come in and join me as we stand silently in prayer, holding a sign. I know it's a sacrifice because kickoff is at 1 o'clock. I know that. But uh, that's a small sacrifice if it changes someone's mind and heart not to terminate the life of an unborn child. Or if it changes someone's mind and heart not to perpetrate an act of violence. If you cannot stand for an hour, bring a lawn chair and sit and hold that sign and pray. And if all that is too much for you, the church will be open and we'll have adoration from two until three with benediction at three. Come and sit in church. God calls us to be like children. Hmm. Very clear in the gospel. Yet we continually vote in favor of terminating unborn children's lives. Think about Proposition 1. If you haven't read it, read it. It further codifies abortion as a right, and it is going to continually, permanently change the minds of our young people and what will be allowed in schools. You need to think about that proposition, read it, and read what I put in the bulletin this week about it. God calls us to be a community, yet we often limit health care based on age and general health condition. Maybe, maybe we just won't treat this person any further. God calls us to realize our limitations, yet we move more and more towards euthanasia and assisted suicide. God calls us to rely on him totally, yet often we reject the gospel of life and we choose our human way of thinking, which leads to the culture of death. It's my observation that we live in the culture of death, the progression of these issues. Abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, making these things legalized and normal, the progression of death. Fewer families come to church. We all know that. Why do you think? We're closing parishes. Fewer people come to church. Fewer couples are actually marrying in church. And if I asked for a show of hands, probably all of us have received an invitation for someone not married in a church who should have been. Fewer children are being baptized. And if I asked for a show of hands for the number of people who are pained because some young person in your family has never been baptized, there would be many hands that go up all part of the culture of death. And at the same time that we observe all these things going on, divisions taking place within families, and families not even speaking to one another, increases in the number of divorces, and the increase in school violence and school shootings. We have our young people and adults dying from drug overdoses, opioids, and fentanyl and more. It's all the progression of the culture of death. 
I and many priests have observed the progression. You have too. And we now no longer even respect those who have lived their lives and have died. Fewer people have wakes today. Fewer people come to have a massive Christian burial. Some are waiting months before they even honor someone with a wake or service. We had a call not that long ago. Someone wanted to schedule a very specific date and time for the funeral because that's what worked best in their business calendar for their own parent. When my parents died, I put everything on hold. We don't even respect the dead any longer. This past summer when I was at my annual scripture conference in Steubenville, a priests were talking as we always do and one priest told a story that I could not believe but let me tell you the person in the story I love her he told a story of one of his parishioners who had been a regular church goer active in the parish she had passed away her children not practicing faith had no wake had no funeral had no burial the children went eventually to the lawyer for the will. I love this woman. She wrote in her will that if my children do not honor me and my wishes for a proper wake, mass of Christian burial, and proper burial in a cemetery, they are to receive no inheritance at all. I applaud that woman. Here and in many rectories, and it's happened to me. I open the door and there's a, an urn of ashes sitting on the steps. Don't know who brought it or who the person is, but probably somebody bought a house and found it in the attic or basement and didn't know what to do. One of my priest friends called and said he had a call from a parishioner that uh, the person next door had died months ago, the family sold the house, cleaned the house out, and they called the rectory around nine at night and said, there's a heap of garbage out there and I can see an urn. What am I supposed to do? We no longer even respect the dead. If we do not respect the unborn, we will not respect the born. That is why we have violence in the schools. That's why we have the issue with drugs and bullying and so on. And if we don't respect the born, we're not going to respect those who have lived their lives and died. Please join me this afternoon from 2 to 3, either in front of the church or here within the church in prayer. When is it that we have a real problem? We have a real problem when good people do not do good things. And I have every confidence that every single one of you, and I know most of you well by now, you're all good people. And I'm asking you to do a good thing, to come and stand for life. And if you cannot do that this afternoon, then do something real and concrete and definable this week to stand for human life. And as you reflect upon who will be leading our country locally and nationally, take the issues of life with you to that reflection. Because if we, as good people, do not take a stand for life, then we will allow the culture of death to continue to grow.